thank you so much, uh, Professor Swaran Singh, and a very warm welcome uh, to our speaker of the day, Professor Renato de Cruz, and uh, all our guests who have joined us for this 41st session of our in our webinars. We commenced with these in the month of May 2020 on a weekly basis. So every Wednesday, we have been having a webinar on various contemporary issues of international relations. Uh, this month onwards, we have changed to the fortnightly mode. So uh, this webinar is uh, the 41st one, as I said. Our Association of Asia Scholars came into existence in the year 2005 when we were registered as a registered body. Uh, we are all the alumni of the Asian Scholarship Foundation. And uh, we lived in another Asian country for a period of almost nine to 10 months. And um, ever since we have been working closely with Ministry of External Affairs and also Indian Council of World Affairs. And uh, we organized uh, several conferences, workshops, uh, seminars in different universities in India and abroad. As a result of that, uh, the outcome we have several publications to our credit, over a dozen books. And uh, we have a flagship journal uh, with Sage Publishers. Uh, it has already completed 11 years and three issues a year, uh, Millennial Asia, bringing out, uh, again, uh, very, very scholarly articles on issues of Asian and contemporary global relevance. Uh, by scholars of repute, and it is indexed uh, in Scopus and other uh, very important uh, econ lit, etc. So, um, and we also organize two international conferences on the virtual platform. One conference we organized on revisiting Gandhi on 30th and 31st of October last year, commemorating 150th birth anniversary of the Mahatma. And uh, the manuscript has already been submitted to world scientific publishers, and we hope to see the book in a few months' time. Uh, we also had a recently a uh, second conference, Multilateralism in the Indo-Pacific, the papers of which are being now submitted, and we are again in touch with international publishers already. The conference was held just in April this month itself, about uh, barely two weeks ago. And uh, we are already working uh, towards, uh, you know, engaging with the publishers. So uh, with a few words of uh, our introduction as Association of Asia Scholars, we welcome you to this 41st uh, webinar on a very important theme. And uh, we can see that there's a lot of interest uh, for this particular subject. So Professor Renato, to introduce you and the theme of the uh, webinar today, Professor Swaran Singh uh, will kindly take over. Thank you, Professor Rina Marla. It's a delight to uh, see the interest that Professor Renato's uh, lecture is uh, eliciting from our participants. Uh, I especially want to acknowledge presence amongst us of Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan and other colleagues of National Maritime Foundation and several other senior colleagues from various uh, universities uh, and National Defense Academy, of course. And I assume that uh, we will all have uh, uh, enormous takeaways from today's uh, discussion uh, for about uh, one and a half hours. Uh, it can stretch slightly more than that. So I think we, all of us, are finding the topic of today uh, perfectly at home with us. Um, I'm talking of the participants from in this case, we've been hearing whole of last year the debate of grey zones uh, on the India-China border, grey zone, gray zone of grey zone operations of China vis-a-vis -vis India in you know new areas of uh, uh, conflict and uh, misunderstandings on the line of actual control. Uh, it's a great delight to see that uh, other neighboring countries, uh, scholars have also felt. Uh, that a similar template is being tried out uh, by the Chinese uh, in China's immediate periphery, uh, both maritime and, uh, and territorial. Uh, so in that sense, topic of today is something that touches not just us intellectually, but also perhaps, but, but emotionally. 
to understand how neighboring countries of china uh, along with india uh, are able to have a similar uh, assessment or analysis uh, and therefore find perhaps also shared uh, strategies and shared responses in addressing that uh, equation which is increasingly becoming a bit of a challenge to the neighboring countries uh, of uh, emerging rising china in that sense and i think therefore the topic of uh, today which is uh, china's uh, day zone operations in the south china sea uh, would elicit a certain uh, i think uh, interesting debate after the speaker has made uh, as usual his initial 25 to 30 minutes of uh, remarks uh, to open the discussion Uh, and then we uh, usually follow uh, one question and one answer each question or each comment gets answered so that each participant gets a sense of having had a take away from today's discussion so we like to avoid bunching of questions uh, and therefore uh, sometimes we spend longer time uh, at least one hour sometimes more than one hour in that uh, uh, question answer session so i look forward myself uh, to that uh, particularly interesting second half of a discussion part where several of the questions are raised and we have this opportunity to engage uh, the celebrated expert on the subject to share his ideas with us and i'm sure most of you are uh, very familiar with the uh, uh, professor uh, roneto uh, cruz de castro who's our speaker today uh, but uh, some of the younger scholars in case um, they may not have followed his works i'm personally very envious of his enormous journal publications i think journal publications is the cut cut cutting edge of any research and if you, you know, try to look at how much of uh, fantastic journal article publishing that professor de castro has done uh, it's really impressive there's a whole range of uh, journals he's been uh, publishing his uh, articles over a period of time he's currently of course a uh, professor of international relations at uh, uh, the sale university in manila i think about 12 years ago i had a chance to visit that campus but he is also now holding a chair of charles liu chi kyung professional chair on china uh, in the same university he has held several positions i think it's so easy to google his name and find out so many positions that he has held he has his phd from uh, united states university of south carolina and he's been uh, repeatedly fulbright fellow Uh, he has been also a uh, consultant to the national security council of philippines uh, he advises uh, not only the national ministries but also uh, conducts courses for both uh, the various foreign ministries institutions and uh, the national defense college uh, in okay and also a deeply grounded academic with constantly keeping in touch with the cutting edge of his discipline in that sense i think it's a great pleasure that to uh, welcome him today and to have him as our speaker so it's a great delight that he agreed to speak to us uh, on a very interesting subject of china's gray zone operations in the south china sea uh, i can go on speaking about him but as i said it's so easy for all of us today to just google his name and you can look at your phone screen so i often say that introducing the speaker is like you know in a concert you see uh, the the maestros fiddling with their instruments and setting the setting the notes of their instruments uh, when i was young i didn't understand that they could come prepared with those instruments uh, it took me some time as i grew to understand they were not tuning the instruments they were tuning the audience in that sense uh, so tuning the audience is where i take this time to introduce uh, our speaker of the day Uh, who's very well known to all of us otherwise and i personally look forward i have my notebook here to take notes and i uh, now request professor uh, de castro to take the floor and uh, share with us his ideas uh, i think he's going to uh, share with us uh, his powerpoint and i'll request dr silky kaur to allow him to share his powerpoint uh, to make his initial presentation professor castro de castro Okay, uh good evening ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me express my utmost appreciation for giving me the honor to deliver a very important topic to a largely uh audience from uh, India or South Asia. And uh my purpose here is probably we could find something in common in terms of the external challenge 
both countries are facing. And that's, of course, the challenge that's emanating from our middle. Uh, supposed to be India is the front door of China. Southeast Asia is supposed to be the backyard. So probably we can find something in common. You know, this how basically China looks at Southeast Asia. It's its backyard. It's maritime backyard. So I'll just prepare my PowerPoint presentation. So, okay. So I've been uh, presenting this PowerPoint presentation in about two, three webinars last week. Uh, two in the Armed Forces of the Philippines, one of, uh, for our, an activity for our think tank regarding the uh, maritime rule, rules base international order. And uh, this is a hot potato right now in the Philippines or a hot, a hot cake, primarily because of the fact that we are now facing this. Uh, last March, uh, around March 20, our defense secretary announced the presence of 240, mind you, 240 Chinese fishing vessels in Winston Shoal, less than about 120 miles from our westernmost island of Palawan. And uh, they're there, sitting there, but they're not fishing. So again, this, create, this uh, basically galvanized the public opinion, despite the fact that we have a government that is bent on appeasing China. So uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting invitation even from the Armed Forces of the Philippines, indicated that this government that is bent on kowtowing to China is also experiencing a major dilemma in the light of what's happening in the, what we call the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea. So let, let me start my presentation by a uh, sweeping discussion on what we refer to as gray zone operation. Uh, this definition in a way reflects a sort of a Western bias, Western American bias, where they look at uh, the, the world, you know, the international system in terms of black or white. You either have war or peace, and there's nothing in the middle. So the notion of gray zone operation is referring to a situation which is not characterized by military conflict. On the other hand, there's no goodwill, there's no harmony, there's rival rivalry and competition. Uh, refers to as both the whole of warfare directed at producing political results to what part of warfare that employs political means to attain political goals of war, however, without a shot being fired. Without any uh, major, uh, yeah, of course, you might have major military mobilization, but you don't have any actual contest of arms. So uh, let's go to some other definition. I'm old enough to remember the Cold War. So uh, during my time when I was in college, it was a Cold War period where uh, basically it's, a, you know, it's characterized really as a gray zone where you have political warfare, include all forms of uh, propaganda, either coming from the left or coming from, uh, you know, the, uh, the West's subversion related uh, measures such as special operations, special forces operation into the enemy country, sabotage or use of agents of influence aim to form break ideas in the enemy's mind. The purpose, of course, is primarily psychological. Uh, I've taken a course on South a uh, international relations of South Asia, and I'm very much aware that your neighbor, I'm not mentioning the neighbor, your southern part neighbor there, is fond of applying gray zone operation against India. Several cases I had my professor, uh, he's already retired, but I still remember his discussion about your dynamic relations with your smaller neighbor and how your smaller neighbor is really bent on using gray zone operation against India because, of course, you have, uh, in terms of military capability, in terms of size. So I've read accounts of those gray zone operations today. The last one I could still remember was in 2008 in Bombay that was covered by CNN. And uh, this reminded me of application of gross gray zone operation, even in a post-Cold War era. Uh, my professor then was uh, Professor Robert Worsing. I don't know if his name rings a bell, but uh, basically uh, made me appreciate more on what's happening in South Asia. So 
Gray zone operations are generally considered as measures that apply the persuasive force of power to force adjustment in military, economic, political uh, relations, incrementally, preferably protracted because there's no application of war. There's, you don't have a decisive battle. You don't have that sudden change of situation. The purpose is slowly shipping the status quo, then suddenly you are faced with a new status quo, or I'm, I'm sorry, a new situation. It involves dividing or, of course, weakening the power of enemy's opponents, attacking his strategy, dividing his alliances, and basically winning the national morale so that society becomes basically weak, can be, of course, subjected to further pressure by the state applying gray zone operation. Gray zone operation blurs the line separating the military, non-military platforms, action attribution for coercive action directed or undertaken to pursue specific political goals ranging, of course, from creating a sphere of influence to undermining an international order. So we were seeing this uh, unfold as you have, of course, our China undertaking a gray zone operation, not only to find its special, its a specific role in our part of the world, in the Indo-Pacific region, but of course, from the perspective of Washington, the undermine the rules-based international system. So uh, let's look at the unique nature of Chinese gray zone operation. For many Westerners, you know, uh, gray zone operation is unique, abnormal, and immoral because it doesn't conform to the rules of war and peace. But for China, this is a matter of statecraft. This is how they have conducted their international relations since the time, of course, of the warring states. So uh, China, of course, is now engaged in a tense protracted geopolitical competition with the United States, uh, which, of course, began as early as probably 2010, but it was only recognized by the Trump administration in 2017 that China is really bent on undermining the rules-based international order that the United States established in the aftermath of the Second World War. So let's proceed. So the Chinese see the evolving context of China relation in particular, and this ongoing great power competition based, of course, on the work, classic work of Sun Tzu, the art of war. The Chinese military philosopher who lived in the kingdom of Wei during the period of uh, uh, during period of warring states. So, if uh, people would ask me, who are basically the historical Machiavellians or those who are in the philosophy of statecraft in our part of the world? Of course, I would mention Sun Tzu, but of course, I will also mention Kautilya. You know, from uh, from the tradition of South Asia. Uh, maybe sometime we could also discuss the difference between Sun Tzu and, of course, Kautilya, Asasasla. But the Sun Tzu's approach is based, of course, on the Chinese notion of power is based on water. Water cannot be seen. Water assumes the form of the terrain. So it fits into the terrain. You could not notice the movement of power. And, of course, this is also reflected, the importance of power in Chinese philosophy is also reflected by the fact that it is always equated with the Chinese notion of qi, power, or the inner power. So, so from the Chinese notion, the qi is in constant, uh, you know, it's in constant motion. It never stops. So does, of course, change. In this strategic competition, Chinese strategy sees the competition as primarily psychological and political. Military campaign as much as possible should be avoided. You know, this follows, of course, the uh, maxim of Sun Tzu in the art of war. The mark of a great warrior is to win without actually fighting. This is, of course, the height. But, of course, you have situations where you have to use force. Like what, of course, China did to India in uh, October 1962 and, of course, recently. So, uh, of course, in the case of South Asia, China supplied force uh, here in Southeast Asia against Vietnam. But that was a long time ago. That was in 1988. So for the Chinese, the application of the military capability is secondary. Uh, ideally, the mark of a great warrior, according to Sun Tzu, and for many Chinese military strategies, 
China should seek victory not in a decisive and bloody war because war, of course, would destroy. As much as possible, the Chinese notion is to capture the resources, the army, and the kingdom of your enemy intact, going back to the period of warring states. But of course, this could only be achieved through incremental slow moves designed to gradually improve its diplomatic, slowly strategic position vis-a-vis -vis the United States and of course, its ally. We see it happening in the strategic competition going on. So let's look at uh, what's happening in the South China Sea. So my presentation would focus on the South China Sea, what's happening in the South China Sea, how China has applied gray zone operation against the Philippines, three cases. Then my last presentation is something I have directed to my people, to my nation. Because right now, uh, of course, I've mentioned this earlier, we have a president that simply is convinced that China is a friend. So it's really a challenge on the part of a number of Filipino academics who know the real score. That, you know, uh, China could be a friend, but we have to take into account China has its geostrategic interests. And for China, what matters is, of course, its geostrategic in interests. Okay, so let me discuss first uh, China's notion of surging second and third force. Again, the, uh, the element of power is equated with water. So let's look at, so since, of course, 2013, China under President Xi Jinping had implemented a hardline policy along its periphery here in Southeast Asia to defend what it sees as its core interests. Uh, I don't know if you have heard or discussed the notion of the Chinese dream. The Chinese dream, of course, is number one, pacifying the peripheral area. Uh, pacification would involve, number one, application of carrots, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, on the other hand, of course, you have the protection of the core interests, the application of, you know, the gray zone operation. China has put particular interest on securing and expanding its maritime rights and interests, such as, of course, territorial sovereignty and economic interests. And this is, of course, something that we could discuss later. Uh, this is something I also emphasize that a major effort of the uh, Chinese government is to transform the People's Liberation Army from a land-based armed forces into primarily naval because the trust right now of China is its maritime domain. So uh, the purpose, of course, is to transfer resources away from the army to the Navy and at the same time also restructure into an effective joint force that can respond to maritime challenges of war against a high-tech adversary and, of course, primarily aim to finally end the uh, how many decades of the Chinese Civil War. For the Communist Party, the Civil War is not over. The Guomindang is, of course, uh, just across Taiwan. And the goal of Xi Jinping, hopefully by 2025, is to finish the Chinese Civil War that began in 1927. And, of course, the long aspect of joint campaign in China's near sea possibly directed against Japan and, of course, directed against the United States. China has ramped up the activities of the People's Liberation Army's Navy and something that we witness here, uh, here in what China considers as the peripheral, are the use of the Chinese law enforcement agencies. Uh, and, of course, not only in the South China Sea, but also in the East China Sea where they're deployed against Japan because of uh, China, uh, China's ambition, of course, to also acquire the Senkaku Islands from Japan. Uh, this enabled China to apply pressure on the countries on its periphery, Philippines, Vietnam primarily, which it has disputes regarding territorial sovereignty, maritime resources, and like to promoting the securement and expansion of Chinese maritime right and interest through reliance on the use of force. Everyone knows, of course, the nine dash line. For the Chinese, this is a, a matter of maritime rights and maritime entitlement that they just drew. The nine dash line, they supposed to be on the areas where their ancestors have navigated and have fished since time immemorial. Ignoring the fact that our ancestors, Filipinos, the Malaysians, the Indonesians, 
have conducted trade, have navigated this water, and has also has reached as far as India. That's why some of our words in Bahasa or in Filipino, we have some Sanskrit or ancient words like guru, so forth, indicating our interaction because the waters in our region has been uh, considered as waters for all. No single power, no single empire have dominated those waters. Of course, for the Chinese mythology, they have. Okay, China, of course, has recently accelerated its expansion and its surroundings. You see, of course, the nine dash line. So every time we have the Chinese foreign minister here, Wang Yi, Wang Yi, Wang Yi would tell uh, tell us, Philippines is a close neighbor of China because this is how the Chinese look at the South China Sea. For them, the maritime buffer is gone. China is only about 40 nautical miles from the you know from our uh, from the Philippines from Luzon and from Palawan because they believe this is already their territorial waters. Of course we can discuss this later. We filed the case in 2013. Of course challenging this claim in the permanent court of arbitration. So how does China uh, build up its coercive capability? Number 1 of course is you have the Navy, the People's Liberation Army's Navy, that currently, of course, claims a growing portion of the entire People's Liberation Army's personnel and budget. Uh, just, I think, until now, the Chinese are showing their first aircraft carrier, the Liaoning, uh, while, of course, the United States Navy has deployed a carrier battle group. So we have this sort of charade happening in the waters of the South China Sea. The Chinese are flaunting. We already have, the, we are now in the process of developing our carrier battle groups. Not just one, sooner or later they'll be showing four. Uh, with, of course, the intention to impress upon the United States that the waters in the first island chain, uh, first island chain, I'm sorry, uh, are now, of course, uh, you know, China could already exert its naval clout. It's not anymore the simple domain of the United States 7th Fleet or the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force. They have to take into account the, account the growing presence of the People's Liberation Army's Navy. Then we have, of course, the People's Armed Police. I'm sorry about the typo error. It's the police. It's a paramilitary wing of the Communist Party. Uh, separate, of course, from what is considered as the professional People's Liberation Army, uh, you have, of course, the uh, armed wing of the party with the primary responsibility of maintaining domestic stability and a secondary role of providing rear support to the People's Liberation Army during wartime. Now, what do we see here in Southeast Asia or in the uh, South China Sea? We see, of course, the White Hall Maritime Law Enforcement, uh, including, of course, the Chinese Coast Guard. That was field, uh, that's what first form. After we have this uh, ten standoff with China in 2012 over near the Scarborough, uh, Scarborough Reef, which is inside the Philippines' exclusive economic zone. Of course, eventually China took control of Scarborough Shoal, and I'll be discussing it later. And eventually it realized that it needs needed to boost its white ships, its civilian power. Uh, that will, of course, make uh, that, of course, create the impression that. Its expansion is not driven by naval might. That you have, of course, the Coast Guard. And a unique characteristic, of course, is the Chinese Coast Guard. It's not, it's not simply involved in law enforcement. It is also involved in China's maritime expansion. Sometimes it's considered a, the surging second sea force. And this is something that we face in the South China Sea. Something that... Uh, our government basically saw materialize one morning uh, around March the uh, blue hauled ships or uh, yeah, boats of the People's Armed Forces Maritime Militia. It is a separate organization from the People's Liberation Army and, of course, the Coast Guard consists of ordinary citizens working in the marine economy, ordinary Chinese fishermen or fisher folks. But they receive military training from the Navy and the Coast Guard to perform tasks, including but not limited to border patrol, 
surveillance, reconnaissance, maritime transportation, search rescue aux auxiliary tasks in support of naval operation in the maritime air domain. There is no the Chinese embassy here in Manila when it was confronted by the Philippine government about the presence of 240 uh, Chinese maritime militia boats. The Chinese embassy here in Manila said, we have none. It does not exist. The uh, Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing also said it does not exist. To a certain degree, in terms of institution, it does not exist, primarily because it is made up of local forces. Constellation of forces among localities, provincial governments, that support the national defense effort, of course, of China that is uh, bent on maritime expansion. At the national level, militia policies are prescribed by the highest body in the Communist Party and in the government. The Central Military Commission, headed, of course, by no less than President Xi Jinping. However, the various militia are under local and provincial leadership. The militia is made up of two components, the fishing cooperatives, that are part of the militia and operates as commercial fishing vessels, primarily involved in reconnaissance, looking at activities, and of course, the more professional and better equipped for direct action missions, operating as maritime vanguard of naval auxiliaries to enforce maritime rights protection and assertion, of course, of China's maritime rights rather than simply commercial fishing. Broadly, these two general types of militias are considered the the People's uh, Armed Forces uh, Militia and, of course, operate as the surging third sea force. The, f uh, the second one, of course, uh, is the Coast Guard. The third one is the Navy. The existence of China's surging second and third sea force yielded China with a formidable second Navy. The uh, annual report on the People's Liberation Army by the United States Department of Defense stated that China quantitatively, not qualitatively, has the largest Navy. It has about 550 ships. Of course, many of them are actually uh, frigates or offshore patrol vessels in comparison to the United States Navy that has about 240 ships. But most of the ships of the United States Navy are for blue water operation. So in a way, you know, the, the uh, U.S. Department of Defense is right when it says that China has the largest Navy in terms of quantity. But the Chinese uh, Navy or the People's Liberation Army is not the only maritime force. And it also it's Coast Guard vessels and, of course, it's law enforcement and militia fleets that could simply overwhelm its literal neighbors in the South China Sea and even in the East China Sea. A major contribution of China's Second Navy is to advance Chinese sovereign claim in the realm of the gray zone that is not, of course, peaceful, but at the same time, it's not marked by combat or military clashes. As, of course, they afford China increasing clout and influence over regional maritime situation without applying the uh, offensive uh, element, of course, of the gray ships or the Navy. Uh, China's Second Navy demonstrates a form of naval power that reduces the risk of escalation while allowing the People's Liberation Army's Navy to focus on more naval mission farther afield, probably directed against Taiwan, probably directed against Japan in the East China Sea, probably even deployment as far as the Indian Ocean, because you also have your issues with China. And I, I guess uh, also pr uh, providing assistance to your neighbor, your smaller neighbor in, uh, in the sub-region. So what are uh, three cases where in China applied gray zone operations against the Philippines? So this began in 1995. I could still remember I was a consultant in the Department of Foreign Affairs during this time uh, when a Filipino fishing vessel saw Chinese build structure. They were just wooden structure. And the Chinese explanation, they were just shelter for the fishermen. They were found on Mischief Reef, a small rocky outcraft lying 135 miles west of Palawan. This is Palawan. This is the westernmost island of the Philippines. You have a number of islands there. It was uh, spotted somewhere here. 
And of course, well inside the Philippines exclusive economic zone. Just look at the distance. Now, this is China. The Chinese Coast Guard patrols water as far as Scarborough Shoal. So just imagine this. Chinese Coast Guard vessel confiscating the catch of small Filipino fishermen that are more than 900 nautical miles away from the Chinese island of Hainan. This is Hainan. So just imagine how expensive China's maritime claim is. Not even the United States Coast Guard conducts such kind of operation. The Philippine Air Force reconnaissance plane during that time confirmed the existence of Chinese structures on the reef. Uh, Philippine air reconnaissance flight revealed the presence of several Chinese vessels surrounding the fishermen's hut. This was, of course, a shock during the time of President Ramos. This was a time, uh, three, this was only three years after we told the Americans that they should leave the Philippines. Because for so many years, we hosted American military bases. Three years after the last United States Marine left the, the Philippines, suddenly we found the Chinese literally knocking on our front door. So in August, you have a number of diplomatic uh, negotiations. You have a matter of posturing. We send some of the ships. The Chinese uh, warships stay away. We send our fighter planes, hopefully, to intimidate the Chinese. They were not intimidated. They stay there. We thought this problem would simply go away. We're wrong. Uh, we even signed an agreement in August 1995 because of the support given by the ASEAN countries. Remember at that time, there were only about six ASEAN member states. So it was easy for ASEAN to generate consensus. And during this period, we had the support of the whole of ASEAN. So China signed a bilateral code of conduct with the Philippines, aimed at preventing similar in uh, incidents occurring in the future. And of course, the usual Chinese solution, and this is something that you have also taken into account when you talk about your lines of control, let's try to settle this dispute by having cooperation. Hopefully, eventually, if we cooperate, we will forget that we have a dispute until China would increase the ante. Okay, then you have another case. At this time, I was in the National Security Council. Uh, one uh, morning, uh, uh, it was announced in the Philippine media, Philippine Navy flagship tried to arrest uh, 10 Chinese fishing vessels that were spotted in a fishing fishing in Scarborough Shoal. This is, of course, close to Luzon. Okay, you have China there. You see, we have a common concern do, uh, do, uh, doing a yoga pose, uh, outdoor flexing, uh, that were spotted at only 220 kilometers away from the main island of Luzon, but of course, again, within our exclusive economic zone. Th this lasted, the standoff lasted for, I'm sorry, for about two months. However, before the Gregoria del Pilar could apprehend the fishing vessels, two Chinese maritime surveillance vessels arrived and prevented the arrest of the Chinese fishermen. The two Chinese civilian vessels then told the captain of the Philippine Navy ship, you are in Chinese waters. Let me just give you a background regarding Scarborough Shoal. Scarborough Shoal was used as a target practice by the United States Navy and the United States Air Force when uh, they were still uh, based in the Philippines. There was no effort of China to say this belongs to us. The claim only happened about uh, 10 years after, of course, the Americans vacated their bases in the Philippines. So you still have a lot of uh, deactivated bombs because this was used as the target practice by the United States Air Force and, of course, the Navy. Now, suddenly, China is telling us it belongs to China on the basis of historic claim. Interesting. So, immediately, China gained the upper hand when it forced the Philippine Navy surf uh, surface combatant to withdraw from the shoal. And, of course, uh, uh, at that time, China has already had an armada of civilian vessels at its disposal. China put the, uh, you know, the 
the pressure of either escalating or escalating the impasse squarely on the Philippines. So suddenly you're faced, confronted by Chinese forces around you. So you're given uh, two choices. Either you fire at them, which would escalate the conflict, or you'll be forced to withdraw. The same dilemma that the Indian forces confronted in October 1962, when they had that clash. I still remember studying that case when I was in grad school. How uh, Prime Minister Nehru thought that, you know, uh, Cho and Lai being his friend, China will never use force. Of course, we know for a fact that Prime Minister Nehru miscalculated during that time. And so did we during the Scarborough show. Fortunately, we did not have simply the, uh, nobody uh, lost his cool and we tried, to, of course, to engage the Chinese in a standoff. Uh, of course, they had all the advantages at that time. China sent then additional patrol ships. Consequently, three huge imposing Chinese civilian vessels confronted the lone Philippine Coast Guard craft at the shoal. Uh, just to end this, China also applied economic pressure. China refused to allow the entry of Philippine bananas. China refused to allow the uh, Chinese tour, uh, what do you call this, tour operations to send groups of Chinese tourists in the Philippines. So you have pressure applied on the Philippines at that time. Incidentally, uh, the area of the Philippines where those bananas were cultivated came from Dabao, Dabao, which is, of course, the province of the current president, President Duterte. Uh, his area suffered, of course, uh, badly when China refused to allow the entry of bananas coming from Dabao during the time of the Scarborough Shoal standoff. Eventually, of course, China took control of the shoal after China reneged on its commitment to effect a mutual withdrawal in June 2012. The Philippines withdrew its lone Coast Guard vessel China, of course, immediately occupied the shoal and prevented Filipino fishermen from entering the shoal again. It's still, of course, being patrolled by Chinese Coast Guard vessels all the way from the Paracel Islands. And uh, what basically triggered this uh, animated reaction of the Duterte administration? Uh, on March 2021, the Department of National Defense informed the Filipino public of the mysterious presence. They were there, they were not fishing. They're just standing there. Uh, and they're ar arranged like phalanx of Roman for troops, remember, during the time of the Roman Empire. So they're uh, stationary there. And of course, there was, of course, a suspicion that they were manned by Chinese maritime militia. Secretary uh, Lorenzana announced an increase in sovereign uh, sovereignty patrol uh, near that, uh, that, uh, that reef, Winston, uh, Winston Reef, which is within 200 uh, uh, nautical miles inside, uh, within the, you know, it's within the 200 nautical miles of the Philippine Exclusive Economic Zone. He also expressed his concern as he called the presence of this, the, these alleged Chinese militia boats as clear provocation action of militarizing the area. In the evening of the same day, the Philippine Department of Foreign Affairs filed a diplomatic protest in the Chinese embassy. Uh, the uh, Philippine government reaction, you know, vigorous reaction, despite the appeasement policy of our president, reflects a recognition that despite its policy of, you know, this rapprochement between the Philippines and China, China will apply gray zone operation against the Philippines. So if you have a friend like that, who needs an enemy? So uh, it had taken note that China has inc incrementally asserted an expansive claim in the South China Sea by uh, this is something I did not discuss, but uh, everyone knows for a fact it's there, building artificial island, fortifying them with missile ports, airstrips, in disputed waters also claimed by Vietnam and, of course, the Philippines. Uh, this was made possible because it has, of course, been swarming simply the navy you already have the navy the largest navy in the world then you have the coast guard then of course the armed militia manning uh hundreds if not thousands of fishing vessels simply overwhelming the uh, you know the coast guard the navy of vietnam the philippines malaysia and indonesia 
uh, with, of course, uh, application of both public civilian vessels effectively dividing and simply overwhelming any literal state's effort to at least, you know, even thinking of driving them away. The best we could do is just show the flag and plead because simply we could not have that number of ships that China could deploy, whether civilian, uh, law enforcement, and, or, of course, naval. The objective is, of course, to accomplish by overwhelming presence what it had been able to do through diplomacy and economic statecraft or naked naval power. That is, of course, gray zone operation, intimidation. Uh, in, two, in the two cases of Mischief Reef and Scarborough Shoal, China's campaign-like approach to gray zone competition and conflict liberally mixes political, military, and, of course, commercial. So always be wary, especially if you're economically tied with China. China will try to say, let's separate the economic from the strategic and political. No, not the way the China played. Not the way, uh, you know, how we experienced China use economic statecraft during the Scarborough Shoal uh, standoff in 2012. So China employs its military, paramilitary forces, government agencies, state-owned uh, state enterprise as weapons for its maritime expansion. Uh, the method of gray zone operation include aggressive commercial coercion. Uh, if you're buying something from China or China is buying something for you, expect it to be affected. Nonviolent coercive military force just showing you their uh, army across the line of control. Intimidating use of law enforcement, paramilitary capabilities, which we see in the South China Sea as well as uh, extensive exploitation of cyber and, of course, information operation. China would always make it appear that you are the aggressor. You know, we always have the saying, it takes two to tango. But for the Chinese, uh, the, uh, China is always on, on the moral high ground. You are the aggressor. You are the, uh, what's it called for this? Uh, you're victimizing China. China plays the victim's role. You know, victimizing me. Those small countries, my goodness, they have changed the definition of bullying. Those small countries are bullying China. Gosh, you know, just imagine the play of words. These actions enable China to contest and, of course, eventually dominate competitive spaces, whether it's land, whether it's maritime, whether it's a matter of information or propaganda gain territory vis-a-vis -vis the Philippines, thereby achieve strategic aims without actually resorting to actual force. So my last presentation here is my advocacy to the Filipino people, that we should not just uh, take it, you know, sitting, or just basically uh, saying that we cannot do anything. Of course, this is the usual position of our beloved president. Just two days ago, he said, we cannot do anything. So let's just allow the Chinese fishing vessels to fish in Philippine territory. My goodness. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's really a very interesting time here. You have, of course, the nation that feels that, you know, where the receiving end and Chinese great zone operation. We have, we have here, of course, a president who thinks that China is his, best, is his country's best friend. So the Philippines must understand and very, be very wary that Chinese foreign policy to the Philippines in particular and other Southeast Asian countries in general, and even, of course, India, that are near, are guided by this dictum. Chinese leaders believe that their country has preponderance of economic and military power, so it's time for China to alter the rules, norms, institution that to govern the world in order to suit, of course, their country's interests. And that is, of course, expansion. Uh, here in our part of the world is maritime expansion. Uh, I think in your part of the world is continental expansion plus, of course, the bad. The essence of political and military uh, warfare consists primarily of neither words or deeds or action, but, of course, of intentions. China's intention is to win without actually fighting to intimidate you, to show you force, that any resistance is futile. You cannot challenge China. 
Number one, China is powerful. Number two, China is always right. Uh, victory should not be measured through successful military campaign, uh, but of course, is to better to win without actually fighting. This is a point I'm raising here. Uh, uh, given the position of our president, we're already defeated. Because for him, what's the point of challenging China? China is simply so powerful. So this is, of course, an advocacy on our part to introduce to our people and, of course, to arms, our armed services and to our diplomats that China is playing this game. That you basically say that uh, there's no point on uh, challenging China. You have given China the all. China already won the game. China is following the game plan of go rather than chess. It is better uh, to win not by eliminating the enemy, but avoiding fighting, moving strategically uh, to achieve relative dominance, survival, and prosperity in an incremental, protracted manner as much as possible without any decisive uh, situation or battle. The Philippines' goal, of course, is to prevent China from fighting, winning without fighting. This requires the application of subtle, indirect, less threatening, and visible countermeasure that must prevent China from achieving its strategic goal. Just the mere act of resisting as what the Vietnamese had been doing is enough, uh, you know, it's enough message for China to uh, impress upon them. You cannot win. You cannot win this. Uh, there'll be struggle. There'll be possibly military clash. So you have to think twice. This will require the Philippines applying asymmetric warfare by adopting strategic principle of water. Water has no constant shape. So if China applies water, we should also apply water. Uh, it is formless, adopts to the terrain. The ability to gain victory is to adopt to one's opponent. So this would require, of course, the deployment of the Philippine Coast Guard, not the Navy, and of course, assistance from Japan, France, uh, to the Philippines instead, of course, the countries, you know, this has been a policy of our president. We got 12 Coast Guard vessels from Japan. Our president decided to deploy them in tourist spots here in the Philippines rather than deploy them in the South China Sea. So this recommendation is directed again to our people in, in the Navy and, of course, in the Philippine Coast Guard. So what's the point of basically asking assistance from India, Japan, or the United States if you yourself doesn't have the will to resist. So this is a point that uh, you know I'm raising right now in our country. We should develop a credible defense capability by focusing our limited resources on building the Navy and, of course, the Air Force. And in this respect, India is providing us assistance by offering to sell to us the Pramos uh, missile, which is very much appreciated in the armed forces of the Philippines. So this will enable us to develop. Uh, both armed services supported by the army should train for asymmetrical warfare against a bigger and more powerful threat than that is for China. But we are realistic enough to know we could not develop the armed forces even if we have to starve ourselves and basically finance the military. Uh, we have to enhance, of course, our strategic alliance with the United States uh, with our security partners with Japan, Australia, South Korea, Indonesia, and of course, India through Quad. And we have to base this alliance on the basis that we are both, all of us are liberal democracies. Next year, we would have another presidential election. So like other liberal democracies, you should also watch, uh, you know, the process here, whether this will be an honest, transparent uh, election and to make sure that the people the uh, you know the rightful representative of the Filipino nation would be the president uh, you know again you have the uh, the uh, the quad which of course incidentally was formed here in the Philippines twice in 2008 and in 2017 so India is of course an active member a proud member of the quadrilateral security dialogue and we're also expecting India as a member of the quad to manufacture the vaccines that's supposed to be provided to the Southeast Asian. You don't want us to kowtow to China just because they are flooding us with their low-quality vaccine. India should play its role. 
Uh, Philippine strategy should be based on avoiding war. We don't want war because there's no way we could win any war against China. The goal is just to li uh, develop limited deterrence and an alliance and security partnership with like-minded countries. Japan, Australia, the United States, uh, and of course, India, the members of the Quad. So the Philippines should move strategically to achieve relative power vis-a-vis -vis China in the West Philippines or South China Sea with the goal of national mobilization based on a whole nation approach aimed at achieving the goal of national survival and resilience am amidst a great power competition. So this is our situation, but we also have to take this uh, advantage, you know, look at this as an opportunity to strengthen ourselves. Because this is a reality that we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot uh, ignore. Great powers, this is basically the, uh, the, the approach of Singapore and Vietnam. Great powers are here. Uh, we cannot simply ignore them. Rather, we have to take advantage of their interaction. So I think this is my, my last slide. So, namaste. I practice yoga, so... Namaste. Thank you, Professor Renato Dicastro. Thank you, Professor Dicastro. Excellent, and I would say very candid. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, roller coaster ride right? because uh, we gave you uh, perhaps a uh, limit on time, and uh, perhaps uh, we could have had a more relaxed presentation. But thank you so much for uh, your presentation. I already want to share with you several compliments that participants have for your PowerPoint presentation. Especially your very interesting uh, illustrations, cartoons using panda, dragon, various kinds of sharks. I like the way you wanted to show us how a small magician, Asian, was trying to show code of conduct to a huge shark to make it go into a little beaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's how Asian is framing the code of conduct. Uh, a very candid presentation, I must say. Uh, and we have several. The participants showing interest uh, in terms of uh, making comments or raising questions. Uh, as a matter of uh, logistics, let me say, as I always do, uh, to make life easier for me to coordinate this session, uh, please switch on your video if you want to make uh, a comment or an intervention or you want to raise a question. Also, to make uh, life easy for me, if you can use electronic hand as we do in Zoom to raise your hand, the uh, electronic hand, and several of you are familiar with that. And then I will be able to see on screen next to you, your hand will be showing. Uh, but if you cannot do electronic hand, I'll even encourage you to raise your hand like this. Uh, but uh, bear with me if I miss not noticing your hand. I just noticed that some hands are already up. Uh, before I stop speaking, because I want to give maximum time to participants, I do want to acknowledge uh, amongst us the uh, presence of Professor Nirmal Jindal. She is a professor of international relations, currently the principal of uh, uh, a Delhi University uh, Satyavati uh, College, uh, an old friend of AES, of course. Uh, before I open it up, I see uh, two hands already up. I want to invite uh, Vice Admiral uh, Pradeep Chauhan uh, from National Maritime Foundation. Uh, I saw some uh, comments he made in the, in the text, but I would request him to a couple of minutes to make his intervention to open the discussion for others. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Swaran Singh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, that was uh, simply a marvelous presentation. Uh, I, I, I've always been a fan of outspoken uh, uh, ness, and uh, Professor uh, De Castro, you have excelled yourself in this. Uh, I have uh, a question for you. And it needs a bit of a preface, so I'll take indulgence. You know, uh, when, when countries like India, when we, when we look at this uh, expression, rules-based order, uh, and we look at the word rules within that phrase, what we mean are, is that that word gets referenced to UNCLOS, it gets referenced to the IMO, it gets referenced to the ITU. But several Western powers, when they use this word rules, they refer to trade rules, uh, which are, which are um, part of the Bretton Woods institutions. Because we worry about the UNCLOS, we worry about the IMO, we worry about the ITU, 
we have a at least in the national maritime foundation and specifically me i have a sense of amazement while watching the asean uh, movement towards getting china to sign a doc or a coc or one more promise of this time i promise i'll be good never mind all my past transgressions so to me this is chasing a chimera it gives people who are in the diplomatic core a great deal of work because it reflects a great deal of activity regrettably activity is being mixed up with accomplishment and uh, you know you have lots of diplomacy lots of movement lots of doing and throwing and achieving nothing because nothing in china's past ranging from these documents all of which china has uh, signed and ratified and all the documents that the uh, us developed for its um, communication and its uh, hope that china would behave all of these are just as i said chasing a chimera that's my view now i want to know if therefore if you wanted to do lawfare first what what if uh, philippines indonesia vietnam singapore india perhaps even malaysia which i doubt were to take china to the permanent court of arbitration again now not as individual countries alone but as a collective would that be a possibility in your opinion what does the government of the philippines look at when it talks about the rules of a rules based order which everybody espouses and lastly what do you what is your own personal view uh, on this business of which rules are we talking about when we are talking about a rules based order thank you very much let me end by complimenting you once again uh, you sound a quite quite a lot like me thank you okay. but regarding rules based we're middle powers in uh, asean so we just go along you know uh, we don't have that much problem with the world bank IMF because what can we do we cannot challenge this and of course uh, you have also taken into account our colonial relations uh, the philippines with the united states singapore malaysia with britain so you know as long as there we won't dare challenge it so we have a more uh, we're more acceptance of the western india of course has a larger economy uh, you are part of the non aligned movement in the 1950s 1960s so you know if you want to challenge it you know what can we do so uh, that's basically our policy now regarding the uh, the arbitration i think there's no more need to file another arbitration case it's already there what the country should do is of course support the philippines but before we could do it we also have a problem here just like i mentioned to you we have a president we have a government that acknowledged the ruling only last year so uh, it's kind of strange but again there's always a saying better late than never so uh even the, the statement of president the 32 nights ago indicates that he's not even aware of the the impact of the ruling he even mentioned this that the waters in the south china sea are still disputed no, that's not anymore disputed because the ruling is basically said those are already international waters. So he had to be reminded, but by my close friend, uh, Chief, uh, I'm sorry, Associate Justice Antonio Carpio said, hey, remember the ruling that was filed by your predecessor and that our country won? So the challenge, major challenge is here in the Philippines for the government to give a wholehearted support to the arbitral ruling presented in the General Assembly of the United Nations and hopefully get the majority votes from the member of the members of the United Nations. That's probably the best we could do. And I think the Quad should support the, uh, the, uh, this, uh, just in case, probably after the uh, uh, next year's presidential election, after we have a president who knows his job, after we have a president that will, of course, champion the cause of you know our territorial rights in the south china sea someone who believes that china could be a friend but at the same time it's also a competitor and you cannot simply take china's word as they are you have to always take it with a grain of salt probably that's the time that you know we could move forward with the 2016 uh, arbitral ruling on the south china sea
I don't think there's uh, any more need for countries. Vietnam initially is pondering on this, uh, but Vietnam doesn't want to break that inter-party relationship. So that, uh, in a way, also differentiates us from, you have a very good relation with Vietnam in terms of arms, uh, but at the same time, we also have to take into account Vietnam still has a fraternal relationship with China in terms of the party relationship. Thank you. Vietnam also had defense cooperation with India, of course. Uh, I see two hands up. Let me repeat that uh, those of you I have seen coming uh, to ask a hand right now. I'll come to you in a minute, sir. Uh, let me say, uh, uh, repeat myself. If you want to ask a question, uh, I will ask you to. Uh, I have noted names uh, now of uh, Ramesh Kumar Madan also. Uh, I'll come to you. Uh, switch on your videos in case you want to make an intervention so that speaker can see you. And second, very quick request, introduce yourself in 30 seconds and then quickly ask your question so that we can have more questions for the speaker. I'll begin with uh, Malin. I will ask you to unmute and uh, ask your question first. All right. Uh, my name is actually Malin Dolker Lepcha. Okay. I'm from Southfield, Darjeeling, which is a girls' college. I'm in my first year of political science honors, and my I would like to say I would like to thank you for giving us this presentation and giving us the time, like your time, to talk about this topic. And my question would be, just humor me a bit. But then, since next year is the elections, and you seem like like you know a lot about like whatever's going on this topic, since you if you run for it and you win. What would you do? Would would you fight? Would you fight fire with fire, or in this case, would you fight water with water? Is my question. That's a very uh, cool well. Point. If you're I'm elected, of course, that will never happen. I'm not a politician, and if I venture into the realm of politics, the first thing my wife will do will be to divorce me. <laughs> 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 well, just hypothetically, uh, first thing, of course, is I will have to change the direction. We have to have a clear assessment of China. Based, of course, on this is often what I say to uh, my fellow Filipinos. China is a friend, but China, of course, when it comes to territorial, uh, we call this territorial integrity, territorial issue, China would never compromise. And mm -hmm. I often refer to the experience of Prime Minister Nehru. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He was a good friend of Cho and Lai. I can still remember my professor telling me, you know, uh, what they call it? Hindi chichi ba 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 ba? Yeah, Hindi. Yeah. Hindi chichi. Hi, yeah. hi. Yeah. He would always tell me that, and we have to read what happened mm -hmm. on October 1962. Nelu miscalculated. He thought that just because he's a close buddy of uh, Cho and Lai in Bandung, so forth and so on, China would never use force. Of course, everyone, again, I mentioned this, uh, he miscalculated. And I said, we should base our, you know, our view of China based on the experience of India, and more importantly, we should also learn from Vietnam. And for Vietnam, uh, they have dealt with China for almost one thousand years, and you know, they're, they, they, they interaction is always dynamic. They never trust the bottom line of the uh, Vietnamese view of China. Never trust them. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, you know, uh, in nineteen forty-five, where you have. Northern part of Vietnam were invaded by the uh, by the Guomindang. Then the French were coming. The uh, Politburo said, "Let's side with the Chinese and drive away the French." Cho and Lai disagree. I'm sorry, Ho Chi Minh disagree. He said, "You know, the last time the Chinese the uh, the, the French would be here, but they wouldn't last very long. <laughs> That's probably how we would deal with the Western powers, the European powers. Mm -hmm. They will not always stay here. The United States." But when it comes, he said, when the Chinese came to uh, Vietnam, they stayed here for 1,000 years. So it's better that we side with the French rather than side with the Chinese. Because once they come here, they occupy you for leave. generations. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Let me now request uh, Commander Dr. Anand Kumar uh, from National Military Foundation. Please unmute yourself and uh, make your introduction. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving an opportunity and thank you very much for an uh, excellent uh, presentation. I've got uh, two uh, questions to ask. Uh, one is uh, when we are very clear that what China is doing and uh, there are always some covert uh, you know, uh, idea behind it, then why are we going 
this code of conduct why uh, asian uh, grouping is not uh, very clearly and openly coming and saying that we would not fall for this uh, you know code of conduct business and law of the seas is okay and sufficient that is one second you said about the fishing militia which is very powerful but they do not recognize now a problem for us to research is that we are not getting credible uh, i mean uh, facts wherein we can write about uh, the fishing existence of fishing militia and their uh, unlawful activities perhaps because you all are closer to home in terms of uh, understanding them and and uh, uh, physically also if there are some good uh, literature or factual uh, information about existence of uh, you know their militia that will help us to build up the story because uh, as far as we are concerned when we want to write or even we write we we fall short of facts to uh, straight way point that it actually exists it is like a ghost uh, you know ship so if you all have got those information and if that can be shared or by way of public publications and all if it can come in a uh, english uh, uh, medium uh, media then it will be very helpful for others also to highlight this issue thank you okay uh, regarding the code of conduct uh there's also been a growing skepticism within asean regarding the code of conduct uh for two reasons number one china started to entertain the code of conduct after the arbitral ruling came out before uh, asean was pushing for the code of conduct china was lukewarm then suddenly china said okay we can start talking about the code of conduct after the ruling came out so this is a tactical concession on the part of the chinese for a code of conduct the second thing that uh, makes us also suspicious of the code of conduct is its militarization of those uh, islands so we have the suspicion that sooner than later china will build a structure on scarborough shoal because this is something very crucial it would create the triangle hainan island jones shoal in malaysia then going up the uh, scarborough shoal so that will give china the uh, the geo strategic position to declare an adis and after china declares an adis that's the time china would sign the code of conduct so china is making sure that the code of conduct will not be uh, detrimental to chinese interests so in a way given its power relationship with the asean countries china is basically dictating the face of the code of conduct Uh, President Xi Jinping promised President Duterte that the code of conduct should be finished by 2022 as a sign of his you know he's showing President Duterte that I really appreciate what you have been doing in the Philippines and of course in ASEAN. Now the second question regarding the sources the Naval War College has a lot of materials. James Kraska came out with a number of material Andrew Erickson Kind of, he even did a presentation in the United States Senate on the Chinese maritime militia, because the, uh, the United States Navy is also studying the operation of the Chinese maritime militia. And uh, was it last year when uh, Admiral Davidson announced that you know they will treat the Chinese maritime militia and of course the Chinese Coast Guard as auxiliary forces of the People's Liberation Army's Navy? so they have to have this facts to show that they really exist i i hope i answered your question emro thank you uh, i let me say i see now the following hands up upasana shital jomel who says he is a biggest fan of uh, professor dikasto and also of course professor uh, uh, professor uh, ramesh kumar madan he is uh, with us i will uh, request professor ramesh kumar madan to make his introduction thank you so much sir my question is to professor thank you very much who will come forward to resolve the issues of contemporary concern in the prevailing circumstances so who who can come and resolve this expansionist policies of china because you indicated that individually philippines is not in position to confront china No, yes, uh, I think it will. Yeah. What kind of combination can can happen? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, of course, is this will take uh, not just a lifetime. This will be generational. This will only be ended if China would achieve its goal 
control of the uh, almost 90% of the South China Sea. Uh, chances are we're not also discounting the possibility of war. And this could be linked, of course, to what will happen in Taiwan. So you have two possibilities there. Of course, once this happened, we're out of it. This will be a game great powers would play. The United States, Japan has already indicated. That's why Prime Minister Suga went to uh, Washington, D.C. I think the Australians are also indicated. Yes, of course, they have the element of the quad there. This, uh, again, this is a reality we'd face. The, uh, let, it's, I think we're not so naive to ignore that possibility. Okay. Uh, it happened 70, 80 years ago here. The largest naval battle was fought here in the Philippines, the Battle of Lady Gulf. We were a battleground the same way it was India. So <laughs> the only hope is we, hopefully we should not go nuclear, but that's poss always a possibility. I tell my students about it. Thank you. Uh, let me request Upasana. You can unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and they ask you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Upasana, and I'm a political science student at Indira Gandhi National Open University. Uh, so, first of all, thank you for your excellent presentation. And my question is. In 2006, China started her science of campaign, and seven years later, she built artificial islands in South China Sea with military outposts. So hereby, she created and captured space in terms of land, air, sea, and also uh, she created the information system there, like the com communication, command, control, logistic, intelligence, everything. So. China, as I could understand from your presentation, sir, that China enjoys a regional escalation dominance in the South China Sea, which is both military and non-military. So this signals uh, that China has a planned offensive long-term campaign posture. So uh, this, under this, she tries to create both stability and instability acting together. Uh, so, so my question is that in this Chinese informationized strategy, um, which is both offensive and an active defense, uh, what are the shortcomings in the current counter strategies and what learnings can we draw? Okay. Uh, so looking at those islands, I, I remember I'll share to you this anecdote. We raised, uh, at that time, I was still working with a, uh, our National Security Council. We informed the United States Navy about their presence. This was in 2014. Uh, the United States, uh, the, the naval personnel, the officers they sent were kind of, okay, it's a matter of fact. Uh, we were kind of puzzled by the fact that the Americans had this cavalier attitude. Then later we realized that, you know, uh, they might be useful during peacetime. You know, the symbol of power, but with actual war, they're sitting ducks. They're just like, I don't know if you remember the Maginot line of the French. They're static. The admirals are here. In naval warfare, you're a sitting duck if you're a static target. So this is how you know the United States Navy views it. So they're powerful. They're very impressive because uh, you still don't have a conflict. But once you have a conflict there, they're sitting ducks to uh, U.S. naval aviation, and of course, uh, for cruise missiles. That's why in the recent uh, standoff, right now you have a standoff. Uh, you have a standoff in the South China Sea. The Chinese send their carrier battle group. The Americans send a carrier battle group led by the USS Eudor Roosevelt. At the same time, they send a marine expeditionary amphibious group, sending a signal to the Chinese, you know, we could destroy those islands, either by na naval aviation or by, of course, amphibious operation. So let's not be intimidated by those islands. Im they're impressive during peacetime. We can see them when we fly. And they, you know, they will send messages to our Navy, to our ship, telling you this is Chinese territory. My goodness. 
But uh, again, this is part of their gray zone operation. Thank you, sir. I, I hope I answered your question. That's a, that's a very interesting perspective. In fact, one doesn't usually hear that kind of emphatic and uh, I would say clear and candid uh, expression as you just did. Let me invite uh, Vikhyat Date now. Please unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Sir, am I audible? Yes. Uh, first of all, good evening to uh, Ratoro, uh, Renato, sir. Yes, good evening. Uh, my, myself, Vikhyat. I am a student of Mumbai University and I have just completed my Master's in Political Science. So, so my question was, uh, do you think that uh, Philippines in future can become a, a fifth member of Quad as, uh, as sir, it would help the countries, means it would be a big help for Philippines as countries like Japan, USA, India can have military bases in Philippines and because of that they could control China's domination in South China Sea and also can have a watch on Taiwan. So, what's your perspective on that? And sir, it would be really means if uh, tomorrow China indirectly takes some action against Philippines, then these three countries, sorry, four quad countries can help Philippines. So, what's your response on that, sir? Before we have this precedent, the Philippines was considered a partner. A partner. So, quad will have this partner. I've uh, participated in a number of uh, level two, not the official. I could still remember when Quad uh, functioned as a uh, track two. Uh, you have think tanks, so forth and so on. So I get invited, not after we have this new president. Uh, whether we will become a member or not, uh, we don't want to be a great power. <laughs> you know, I have to admit, members of the Quad are great powers, right? Australia, military capability, Japan, India has nuclear weapons, and of course the continent. Uh, we know where we stand. We'd rather stay here in, uh, within ASEAN, which is, of course, an association of middle powers. So let's keep that uh, international hier hierarchy intact. <laughs> <laughs> you are being really uh, generous, I would say, in compliment. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it is, you know, it's, this is something I've discussed in a it's a regional power when we <laughs> we are also discussing uh, these days quad plus and quad plus plus so there we'll could potentially be many other members let me invite now jobel please unmute yourself and uh, make your intervention yes sir uh, hi sir uh, hi sir uh, uh, how are you there sir how are you there i am i am i'm a i'm a filipino by the way say sir and uh, I'm very proud that uh, I I hear you once again, sir, because um, the last time that I heard you like this is, I, I believe, that was 2015 when you lectured in the National Defense College of the Philippines when we were younger defense analysts. Okay. I was a, um, a former defense research analyst in the, in the armed forces of the Philippines, and you told us um, many years ago that we have to have our patience. And right now, I'm working with the National Security Council. And thank you so much, sir, because I owe you one. Sir, my, uh, since you mentioned earlier that um, the, uh, the Indo-Pacific and, of course, the water security dialogue, for example, um, may, may, may I ask, sir, from your perspective, um, what is a good strategic alliance or alliances? And um, what do you think is a, great, uh, is a good position of the Philippines um, way beyond this um, maritime and territorial uh, dispute with with China in the midst of this industrial revolution 4.0 because of course, um, based on the news and other uh, discussions not only in the television, uh, there's been a lot of, of uh, cybersecurity issues of uh, also coming from China. And so meaning to say, it's a, it's a, there's a lot of angles that we can see from, uh, from uh, Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese um, acts. So it's not only the maritime and territorial, but also with the with the cybersecurity. So do you think, sir, that the that your perspective about the strategic alliances could help help us uh, in the midst of uh, in this uh, in the Pacific in this uh, quadrilateral security dialogue to uh, uh, to at least protect our um, interests, but also the um, ASEAN 
ASEAN led uh, regional uh, security call. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, first of all, we have to be very technical yes, when we use the term alliance. Uh, we have to differentiate alliance from other forms of security relationship. In the case of the Philippines, and this is something I always tell, we only have one alliance, and that's with the United States. Yes, because in an alliance, you expect your partner to give you assistance. Of course, the best ally is the most powerful one. And of course, the most powerful is still the United States. And another thing, it's still, and uh, the Indians would agree with me, it's still a democracy. In a democracy, what you see is what you get. And of course, it has correcting mechanism of elections. And of course, it has public opinion. You have, of course, pluralism. It's not controlled by a single party. Uh, it's still the best uh, alliance for us because we're, if we still consider ourselves as a liberal democracy. On the other hand, we have security partners. Uh, we have alignments. Countries, that we share common security interests, but we don't expect them to provide us assistance because we, are not, we haven't signed any mutual defense treaty with them. So uh, on that, uh, on, uh, in terms of security partners, we have Japan, we have Australia, India, of course, brought, will be a security partner. Uh, ASEAN is a different category. ASEAN will be a more of uh, the term used by the late Michael Liefer was an encant, you know, and a sort of association of countries that do not want to go into war with each other. ASEAN has become a bit useful in terms of uh, uh, China. So that's where you have this umbrella. But definitely we should never ch consider China as an ally. Okay. Because I have heard people in government that China is an ally. If you need an ally like China, you don't need an enemy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have heard it that China is an ally. My goodness. Do we know the meaning? How would your uh, China provide you assistance when China basically aims to deprive our country about 85% of our exclusive economic zone? Right? Oh, we have it. it's an uh, outstanding dispute with China. And uh, this is something that we Filipinos have to understand. China's goal is to affect a maritime expansion at our expense. And of course, another element. And this is something we get from Cautilia. Thank you for the geography that. of alliance, right? The farther you are from the country, the better will be an ally. That's a uh, the circle, concentric circle of Cautilia. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for uh, giving references to India in this case and also being so clear and candid in your comments. Uh, let me now request Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar from National Defense Academy to make his intervention. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, let me, uh, you know, uh, uh, start my argument with small uh, concern. That uh, Professor Renato, you have made a st strong observation and something creative, which I also never heard or come across. The use of this uh, term gray zone operation. Sir, I have two small questions to ask. First question is, uh, do you think that this term gray zone operation can also be applicable when we used to discuss the territorial disputes between two countries? If I could take a reference of India and China, because I, I find a kind of similarities. You are referring specifically to Philippines. I understand they have a maritime boundary, but but can we think and apply this idea when we talk about the territorial uh, issues? Second, sir, my co important question is: you have referred to a new thing that uh, militias, second line of uh, upsurge, third line of upsurge, like paramilitary and all that you talk about in the maritime domain. Even India does not have that kind of a strong culture to support the paramilitary concern. Uh, so far, maritime domain is concerned. Uh, so, but I would like to add one thing here is that, sir, when we talk about the PLA's expansion and it is an integrated commander, it has an integrated command and control structure. We in India are now moving into that direction aggressively. Uh, PLA also has an added concern, which I would like to mention here. I, I think all of us may be knowing that thing also, but I think it is important to add this, that PLA has a strong business empire kind of concern also. I mean, I could not call it as a nationalist kind of army. They are rather a big, huge business tycoon. Those who are having a support for the military to venturing in the several areas. So do, don't you think that all their kind of, these kind of, you know, what I should say, adventures in the maritime domain 
are thoroughly supported by their business venturing and they have a business interest also rather than i talk about the strategic interest alone okay uh, first question is terms of uh, gray zone operation yeah uh, it's also being applied in india as those incremental those clashes going to bhutan so forth and so on it's gray zone as much as possible they don't want to have an actual clash now second why do we have militia in the south china sea uh, number one of course is the nature of the terrain uh, this was a result of an incident that happened between India and Japan ar around 2004 uh, when the Chinese sent their Navy and the Japanese sent their Coast Guard. So this put the Chinese in a sp on a spot. Uh, they were criticized of being, you know, very aggressive sending the Navy. So this is where they realized that when it comes to, uh, you know, pursuing their maritime expansion, they have to uh, apply first what the Japanese did, law enforcement, then later on, probably this is uh, also a carryover of China's revolutionary past. This is a form of Chinese, uh, you know, Mao Zedong, during the time of Mao Zedong, when Mao Zedong, the people's, uh, the Red Army then used guerrillas before they formed the conventional army. So this is also applying the people's war in a maritime context. Now, the third one is, I think in terms of the businesses, I'm not an expert in the people, People's Liberation Army's, uh, Army. My area of specialization, of course, is Philippine-U.S. Alliance. I heard that as late as the 19, you know, before the 20th, uh, 21st century, the military has been called to di uh, diverse itself of their business dealings because they have to prepare for war. Uh, this was during the time of Deng Xiaoping, but after Deng Xiaoping became old, uh, Jiang Zemin and his successor, especially Xi Jinping, will have none of this. Xi Jinping would always say, every year you have to prepare for combat, you have to prepare for war. You cannot prepare for war if you have your businesses. So uh, I think uh, uh, that has been the case right now, part of their restructuring. Uh, they have uh, already uh, removed the business, uh, they call this empires of the military, probably individually, but not anymore in terms of the institution. Thank you. We have uh, Sheetal Gurung uh, who has requested to make an intervention, but I perhaps do not see her on my screen. Is Sheetal Gurung uh, listening to me and would like to ask her question? Yes, Sheetal, I can see you now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sheetal Gurung. I'm from I'm a political science student from Southfield College, Darjeeling. And thank you so much, sir, for your wonderful presentation. And so my question is that, uh, sir, so my question is, uh, what are your views on positions of U.S. in uh, uh, in South China uh, Sea and disputes and also the China strong view on uh, global, like uh, global maritime uh, orders? Thank you. Well, in case of the U.S. position, there have been a change. Before, they always say that the primary interest is the freedom of navigation. As a trading country, the concern is, of course, to ensure that the waters in the South China Sea remains as global commons. I think that has changed last year. Uh, when uh, former Sec uh, Secretary of State Michael Pompeo announced that their policy regarding the South China Sea will be based on the arbitral ruling which is, uh, you know, simply, uh, you know, the arbitral ruling has only uh, some, one message and the, the key element of the arbitral ruling, that China's nine dash line has no historical and legal basis. So uh, this is basically what has changed. And I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm supportive of it because it's uh, based on the uh, claims that the Philippines won from the arbitration. Uh, what's the second question, please? The strong view of China on the, like maritime order. Maritime order? I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Uh, maritime? Like, uh, in, uh, like in your um, presentation, you were discussing about maritime and uh, Ch China, China's maritime on. So that is what my question is. On maritime comments? Maritime order. order. Maritime order. Oh. 
Views based on of power. China on maritime it's, order. Yeah. Uh, China's position, I've heard it. I have heard this from a Chinese academic uh, who happened to be a good friend of mine. Uh, we had this conference in uh, Singapore. He said, the rules are there. They were created by the power, you know, big powers. Yes, positivists, you know. Uh, rules are, of course, also determined, cannot be abstracted from power. China accepted those rules because China was weak. But now that China is powerful, China is in a position to alter these rules. So this is how China sees the rules-based international system. Uh, the rules-based international system were created when China was not yet powerful. But now China is powerful. China is in a position to change those rules according to Chinese interests. I think that will also be the case of India as India also becomes more powerful. That India would have to have a say in how those rules are changed. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. I noticed Thank you, also, sir. Thank you, Guru. Yes, Guru. Uh, I noticed that we also have Captain Sarjeet uh, Parmar with us. I don't see him on my screen, but he's raised his hand. Yes, I can see you now. Wow, it's a very good uh, indulgence of National Maritime Foundation with us today. Thank you for this uh, very, very powerful team today with us. And thank you, Dr. Swaran Singh. I'll invite you to make your intervention now. I will thank you so much and uh, great to see you after a long, long time. And I hope everybody's staying safe. So, Dr. Castro, I've got a specific question and your views on it. You know, there's a very muted uh, discussion about something which is called a middle park quad. Oh. And it's mainly a debate that has, I think, emerged from Tokyo. And a little writing about it from some other corners, but it's very muted. And it's not very often that we get to engage with uh, a person from the Philippines, which is an honor. And uh, your, your talk is as candid as it can be. So my question to you is, what are your views on the efficacy of a middle park quad? If at all, it has to come about. Thank you. I, I think I heard it during the time of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. It was actually Australia that was proposing it after the quad died. Many, because years it, ago. many years ago. It was Kevin Rudd. So he came out with this offer of middle powers. And the middle powers he was talking about uh, was, he developed this notion. Japan was not included. Kia. South Korea. Indonesia, Australia. So supposedly cushion the uh, the buffer between China and, of course, the United States. So this middle powers will be the buffer to prevent a clash. Uh, of course, Kevin Rod introduced it to the ASEAN countries. Uh, of course, ASEAN is you know ASEAN is very jealous, very protective of its uh, what's the term for this? The uh, central role. So it died in that. It was killed in Sydney uh, during that conference. I, I was not invited. I was invited at the time. I was still r r younger, of course. <laughs> so they invited the more senior academics. So I got invited in those uh, peripheral conferences in Singapore, in Malaysia. And of course, this was funded by the Australians. So the Australians was floating this, the Kia uh, sort of. A, but it died in Sydney. Uh, when they presented to the uh, more senior ASEAN academics, you know, they were they torpedoed it. They said, what? You know, we don't want ASEAN to lose its central position. It died a natural death, much quicker than, uh, uh, no, a quad is, at least quad has been resurrected. And I yeah, have no. a lot of, the quad has uh, been resurrected in 2017. Correct. In fact, there's a voice that came out of Tokyo sometime last year. But let's see where it goes. And thank you for this opportunity. Okay. Stay safe, everybody. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Captain Tamla. Good to see you. Uh, let me now go to uh, request Oliver Nelson uh, Gonzalez. Uh, please introduce yourself briefly and make your introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Professor Swaran Singh. Uh, good evening. Uh, Professor De Castro, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. My name is Oliver Gonsalves. I'm an associate fellow with the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, I have just one question. Uh, what prevents the ASEAN nations or rather the countries that have been affected by China's expansion in the South China Sea from exploring a blockade of uh, these artificial islands? Uh, 
as the, the way i see it it could a uh, starve out these islands and b provoke a response uh, from china which could give uh, uh, countries like the philippines the uh, upper hand in this tussle okay, okay. Uh, two reasons number one asean does not have that naval capability uh singapore has a navy but it's primary very coastal indonesia has a big navy but it doesn't have those uh those warships uh we're only building our navy uh under this administration then you also have to understand asean is divided asean is divided between the maritime southeast asian countries that are generally suspicious of china then you have the continental asean countries who couldn't care less about the south china sea cambodia laos myanmar thailand they couldn't care less so that's none of their business and of course um many of these continental southeast asian countries like cambodia laos myanmar they are china's best friends especially cambodia so asean in a way is paralyzed when it comes to the south china sea dispute and it's shown by the fact that uh it is taking time for asean and china to come out with a code of conduct because half of the asean countries couldn't care less whether there's a code of conduct or not it's none of their business asean is a highly intergovernmental organization i hope i answered your question thank you in fact the next question also goes to national maritime foundation dr saurav thakur uh, is the next to ask uh, question of the intervention thank you sir uh, good evening uh, professor castro my uh, sort of one of the uh, key sort of points in your presentation that i kept repeating uh, was this learning from your neighbors you even mentioned that in uh, philippines to an extent can also learn from india's experiences with china in the past uh, now in a sort of a recent book that came out uh, on uh, called in the dragon's shadow by sebastian strangium about southeast asia he talked about how uh, philippines does not because of it lacks a proximity or a border with china historically there is no historical precedent uh, to understanding the maritime dispute with china how much of this distance or uh, of this lack of precedent in philippines own history uh, sort of runs uh, into its foreign policy as well and as a counterfactual sort of question here uh you attributed a lot of the pivot to china let's say uh in the recent years to the idiosyncrasies of the president uh, uh the current president of philippines but there is a longer history if you look at the past 50 years philippines has slowly moved towards the bilateral relationship with china has improved even under the previous uh, regime such as president arroyo in the first decade of 21st century Mm -hmm. so if let's say if the current president was not in power how do you see uh, philippines would have dealt with this issue differently okay uh in terms of historical actually there is long historical the first threat to the spaniards spanish rules came from the chinese pirates so it's ingrained in our history and uh at that also during the spanish period you have a lot of chinese migration here and you have a number of revolts that happen directed against the chinese uh, the spanish spanish colonial rule eventually a number of those chinese became uh in oh, i was just turn for this inculturated with the natives they married the natives they married the spaniards they created an own strata or a class called the filipino chinese mestizo meaning mixture because of our spanish they're basically very suspicious of the chinese coming from the mainland so we have this dynamics too we have a lot of filipino chinese that do not like the chinese from the mainland because they you know they consider them as different because they have been here they have already become filipinized so this is part of our dynamics with china so this is we you know in a way we base it from this perspective which is still uh there's a need for more nuance regarding this and probably we should learn from vietnam probably learn from india on how to deal with china especially of course i always give uh, emphasis on vietnam because of their long experience now regarding uh this president yes i agree with you during the time of president arroyo but president arroyo tried to balance 
China with Japan and the United States. In this case of Duterte, it's just China. You know, he has this sort of unrequited love affair with President Xi Jinping. He would announce it in public. I love Xi Jinping, my goodness. It makes me feel so embarrassed to be a Filipino. He even delivered a speech. I'm not kidding you. Look for it. He even asked President Xi Jinping to make the Philippines a province of China. I'm not kidding. Check on YouTube. And my goodness, I said, all the heroes, our past heroes of the Philippines are probably rolling inside their graves because the highest official in the land wants the Philippines to be a province of China. I'm not kidding you. He delivered the speech in front of the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. The Chinese ambassador was there. You can even look at the face of the Chinese ambassador. So this is the, ex uh, I don't think, you know, some people will say it is idiosyncrasy. Others will say something else. Thank you. I'm, I'm loving very candid uh, approach that you have in answering questions. There's another president who fell in love in 30 seconds with Kim Jong-un, and I think all of us remember that. So there are always national leaders who make interesting uh, you know, points uh, in terms of the way they conduct their personal diplomacy. Uh, unless I have missed some requests for making an intervention, uh, I will only now request the last uh, question uh, to come from uh, one of our uh, own team members, Dr. C.P. Kaur. So I hope I have not missed any requests. And uh, with that, I will request uh, Dr. C.P. Kaur to make the last intervention of today. We are already beyond time by about 22 minutes. Uh, thanks to such an energetic uh, talk and answers that we are hearing from the visit. Uh, Dr. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, sir, for your very enriching talk. And my question to you is that what are your views on the role of institutions like United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which helps in maintaining rule of law uh, on high seas? So they, what are their, uh, your views on a specific role uh, with reference to artificial island buildings in the South China Sea? Okay, uh, number one regarding UNCLOS is something very important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still in a formative stage, so we should basically encourage UNCLOS to strive. That's why we should not allow China to challenge UNCLOS. China's refusal to recognize the ruling, uh, you know, it's not just between the Philippines and China, it's about the international community and China. This is also a reflection of how China will behave as a great power. So on the basis of this, UNCLOS is very important as a gauge on how China is behaving as a great power, as, of course, and a very important regime that will, of course, guide states and how they will manage their maritime environment. Regarding the artificial islands, of course, I already mentioned, they are, of course, uh, in terms of symbolism, they're very powerful. They are impressing upon us that China has control of the South China Sea. But actually, during times of war or conflict, they're useless. Okay, that's it. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I think it's an interesting discussion we had today where we started, if you remember, by talking about the physical gray zones uh, of India-China line of actual control. And the Professor De Castro began by saying that there is a Western understanding which is much more material and physical looking at grounds uh, in terms of uh, gray zones. And then he took us very quickly to the ancient civilizational DNA and Sun Tzu, where he talked about how winning wars without fighting a battle. That is where the whole spectrum of operations is where gray zones are located. So when China, as he said, is fundamentally aiming at what he called pacifying the periphery, not confronting the periphery. That is why they're incremental and they always change gradually in terms of their uh, influencing and expanding their uh, influence and reach. So very interesting way of outlining how in the spectrum of operations that China has, which many of our think tanks have also debated in terms of unconventional warfare, which is mainly when you look at it from territorial perspective, continental perspective, but maritime, a whole spectrum of strategies that are usually not seen as uh, military strategies and he included incentives like BRI 
all the way to militias and fishermen who do not actually go there for fishing but are part of the state structures. So the gray zones in terms of thematic understanding of the spectrum of operations that China has had, how those gray zones of operations are located in enabling China, as he says, uh, in becoming a very formidable challenge because uh, it's not easy to uh, confront, as he, as he mentioned. Uh, and of course, it is also not an option to appease and give away. So these are difficult choices that uh, the countries in the neighborhood have in addressing the so-called uh, China challenge. He, of course, had much to say about the current uh, uh, regime in, in case of Philippines, and uh, I'm sure he's looking forward to elections next year. Uh, Rodrigo Duterte has made the history in several ways. We all remember his description of President Obama. Uh, other than his comments uh, and in his love for President Xi Jinping, and his comments about how he wants to conduct various uh, law and order you know, operations at home. Uh, so he's a persona uh, which has to be understood in that kind of uh, special uh, sort of continuum of uh, very, very uh, unusual uh, uh, diplomatic uh, gestures and uh, comments. Uh, but I'm sure there must be some method in that madness. And, you know, he has his own calculations. We will see how the public in Philippines, how the democracy in Philippines responds to his tenure and what we see in coming elections. Uh, Philippines also is a strong uh, uh, democracy in that sense. We have seen very powerful leaders being removed uh, using either civil unrest or uh, other methods of uh, electing leaders. And so in that sense, I think it's a very interesting takeaway for me and I'm sure many of our participants how China becomes formidable primarily because of these spectrum of gray zone operations, which are neither military nor, nor, nor they are non-military operations. And they are difficult to categorize in the conventional sense of how the countries in the periphery are making their military strategies or maritime strategies and to respond. I heard one participant uh, saying that India doesn't use paramilitary forces and the way Chinese uh, uh, Professor De Castro outlined uh, are using militias and prisoners. And so other countries do not actually look at those as options in terms of their military strategy. And that makes this spectrum of gray zone operations uh, perhaps complicated in, in also not just addressing, addressing, but even understanding the power and progress and excess and the size and magnitude that they have in the overall planning of China and the leverages that, of course, Professor De Castro also brought out that China has in supporting that whole spectrum of initiatives in expanding. And uh, of course, I, I, uh, I was uh, particularly intrigued by his very, very candid comments about uh, you know, countries in his understanding that still think there are options to destroy those artificial islands of China. Uh, that's a very interesting interpretation to hear. Uh, so many takeaways, I suppose, for all of us. Uh, and it's a delight to hear uh, Professor De Castro uh, speak to us. Uh, we will hopefully continue uh, with these online interactions because they are becoming so attractive and cost-effective. We don't have to pay for his uh, flying to India or booking him in a five-star hotel. Uh, so it's a, it's a good thing for uh, relatively poor organizations like we are. Uh, and I think we will be delighted to continue these interactions online. And I'm also delighted to see uh, extremely positive energy of participants, one after another questions, and very interesting comments coming from the floor. Uh, and I'm, I'm, myself, you can see I'm excited. I'm talking more than I should. Uh, I should stop right here and uh, request my colleague, Professor Dina Marva, to formally propose a vote of thanks. Thank you so much to everybody, and particularly thanks to Professor Dina so, Professor Dina Marva, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor Singh. I completely uh, echo your energy and enthusiasm in thanking our speaker for today and all the participants who have been here with us today. I think we could continue to engage you all night and not even allow you to have your dinner or sleep. 
so <laughs> thank you so much uh, for your kind patience and uh, you know the overwhelming response that we got almost 90 participants um, despite uh, the pandemic uh, situation and despite people being on the online platform for hours together i remember when i was in the philippines in 2015 and uh, the exhibition of truths and lies was being taken around and it was also uh, displayed even in india by the ambassador of philippines to india and uh, that was the time when there was so much uh, optimism about uh, the ruling of the pca and uh, you know how things would take a turn for the better but uh, and then of course we have uh, you know president duterte being bank rolled so to say by china and then things completely uh, take a different turn so all those um, you know beautiful maps that had been set out at camp akinaldo and you know taken around the world because it was a traveling exhibition i remember and um, it was it was really really uh, remarkable to see and as you rightly said so candidly that 95 85% of the waters is what um, china really claims uh, in the south china sea and then coming all the way to the indian ocean and you know that is why the interest in india also because uh, the second and third kinds of you know this gray zone operations is of concern to all of us together and uh, we really can't thank you enough professor de castro and we do hope we would have another opportunity to engage with you Uh, and thank you so much for this and uh, thank you to all our participants for joining us today this evening and staying with us and our next webinar the 42nd session of our webinar will be on the 5th of may at the same time at 5:30 pm and uh, the talk this time again we are looking at the maritime and that's going to be sri lanka by a friend of ours um Asanga Abeguna Sekara whom you must have uh, heard of uh, he is uh, going to be speaking to us on uh, Sri Lanka's geopolitical challenges past uh, and present so again i'm sure that's going to be a promising talk and we look forward to each one of you joining us in the meantime stay safe stay well and hope all your near and dear ones are also safe because we in delhi there's no house which is not impacted by this pandemic so stay well uh, and our friends from all over philippines uh, and uh, elsewhere who have joined us in india thank you so much namaste i am tempted before you go professor dikastro uh, i am tempted to say uh, my colleague dr rina marwa had one to one afternoon tea with elda marcos during her tour to philippines <laughs> okay <laughs> namaste 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 thank you so much namaste <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much sir okay thank you bye